but there was one woman. You know, most of the Germans always say they had, uh, they couldn't do anything. I've written about it. In the first camp I was, which was called Bolkenhain, there was a woman whom we addressed as Frau Kiegler. I remember when I first saw her, she looked like a bulldog. Her voice was really almost not human, and I said to myself, oh my God, she turned out a decent human being. And I'm sure she was watched very carefully. She must have been given the position because of her looks, you know, she, she looked, uh, you know, very angry and like that. She was a good and very honest woman. Once when uh, Himmler, there was somebody that came, and he, he was known that if they ever found anyone not at work, they were sent straight to Auschwitz. And as it happened, it was the only time I and two other girls had a very high fever and we were allowed to stay in camp. We were working in the weaving mills that was in Bolkenheim. And she came in, took both of us, the three of us, dragged us to the factory, started our looms. She had worked on the looms before and she says, pull yourself together. Today it's life or death. Before I left Germany, I left at the deposition that if she's ever found, she should be honored. And God knows I would have honored her wherever I was, in the United Nations probably, because she pinned a lie to all the lips of those who said they had no other way of doing it. And that is not true. And remember that. If you see injustice of something bad, you can always do something. You can reach out to the person, even if you cannot save them. You can reach out and say, I care. And she did that. And to me, she has the blessings. And I always wrote about Frau Kiegel. So I think this perhaps is my answer to you. Thank you very much, University of Maine. Our next question will come from University of North Texas. Hi, this is Patrick Push. And I'd like to thank Mrs. Klein for her message of tolerance and love. And I'd like to introduce Vanita, who's going to ask our question. Hi, um, from the University of North Texas. I was wondering how your children deal with knowing what has happened to you. Um, I think that I can say with a degree of pride that uh, my children, um, I tried to bring them up as normally as I could. I will tell you, because my children didn't have grandparents, um, they had the biggest birthday parties I could make. I felt that uh, they should not have the burden of what they have lost. And uh, if I may say so, they have really given me incredible joy, support, and great love. And uh, if you think that I'm exaggerating, mothers usually do, but um, perhaps I can just tell you one thing which would amuse you. I have uh, eight grandchildren, seven granddaughters and one grandson. And uh, they're, they're very caring, of course, make a lot of fun of me, you know, grandma does and grandma does. But um, one grand, the oldest granddaughter once sent me a card and the outside of the card said, why did a grandmother cross the street? And inside it said, because she saw someone who didn't see her grandchildren's pictures. <laughs> so, so I would say, perhaps, and this, I know it's a little funny, but I would say that I have had a very good relationship with my children, and I am proud that eight of my grandchildren, I should say of nine now, because one granddaughter got married, that they have never given me a moment. They, you know, they, they were never expelled from schools. They were never on drugs. Um, they have given me truly and I have people who can say that, Bess, you know, but children and Nancy, you know, if you can get up here and say something, that I'm telling the truth, that they have been good kids. And, uh, and try to do that to your parents, you know. Thank you very much, University of North Texas. Our next question is going to come from University of Northern Iowa. Good evening. Thank you for um, sharing your story and your life with us. I hope that we have all learned something. 
And my question is, you have spoken a lot about tolerance and respect for others, and your foundation was also um, created for that reason. Um, do you think that individuals have become more tolerant and respectful? And how do you see this change, if any, in the U.S. versus other parts of the world? I, I do believe, and I think this is why uh, my husband and I were so fortunate that um, Beth and Nancy started our foundation. Uh, and I'm quite sure you could get all the material of the type of work we are trying to do. It has given us a great deal of comfort hearing from kids from literally all over the world, thousands of letters and, and help. And um, I think also that um, because the world has become global, but unfortunately, you know, kindness and love has, has not been as global as I hope it did. But because, you know, you can now talk to kids all over the world, and I think this is where young people can understand each other better. I think it's bridge, bridging not only the distance, but the thoughts and the influences where people learn about other cultures and other religions and other races. I think this is the most important thing, to not what divides people, but rather you know, what brings people together, I think has made a difference in tolerance, and I pray that this will go on. And as I said, this is what we have tried so desperately to do. And perhaps in one way, and I'm of course conscious that the end of the week is Thanksgiving, that perhaps we can foster that wonderful thing, that Thanksgiving, you know, is not just the feast of the turkey and everybody tries to be on a diet before, but the idea is the gratitude for the bounty that we have gotten, not only the bounty of food, but also the bounty of new medical knowledge, of education, of freedom, of all the things which are ours now, and to give it back to those who don't have it in such abundance. Fordham University Graduate School of Social Services, the New York Manhattan campus. But perhaps you might just tell us uh, what do you have planned for the future, Gerda? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know this. You know the story about not buying green bananas. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's that's a very kind question. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Did you see the cane I came on? I felt like the wicked witch from the West. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I have a couple of books coming. <laughs> One is again the book called The Blue Rose, which, which I wrote for a child of a former neighbor of mine, and that is about mental retardation. And the very newest thing, which is just coming out, it's a video and a book, and it's called Epo. And that is about autism, about an autistic child. And that is um, a conversation between the child and a butterfly. And of course, the butterfly who had, you know, started being um, homeless and uh, not knowing its parents and then becoming uh, a caterpillar who was fat and ungainly and uh, Nobody knew that the inside glands were sweet, the birds would have eaten it. And then hanging in a chrysalis upside down, remembering only the sunshine, I think, and then when the chrysalis opens and it comes out as a butterfly, and I mentioned the butterfly before, and this is what's coming out. And the story is called Epo. And people say Epo, so I said, you know, the child asks the butterfly, what is your name? And uh, the butterfly says, my name was Epo. What is Epo? It's spelled E-P-O-H-E. -E. And when you read it backward, it spells hope. And I guess in a way that is also my story. You know, I was inside the chrysalis, you know, the whole bit. And uh, hanging upside down and what have you. And uh, think of it as Epo. Because hope really is the eternal uh, promise and the star for tomorrow. So, this is coming out, we'll do a little work on that, and, and other than that, I guess, maybe baking cookies or something.